This podcast is brought to you by the self-publishing formulas Facebook Ads for Authors premium course. Registration opens on the 3rd of June for a limited time. To join the waiting list and to get a free masterclass on using Facebook ads to increase your author mailing list, you can visit selfpublishingformula.com. Hello and welcome to episode 12 from the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, hello. Welcome to the SPF podcast. Here we are again, Mark and James Blatch. Have you had a good week, Mark Dawson? I have been very, very busy, James. We've been, uh, so we're recording this slightly ahead of broadcast date. And I've been very, very busy with the uh, final edits and working with my launch team for the launch of the new Milton book, which will be going out the day that this podcast goes live. Yes. So we should say we are recording this about six days, my math works, ahead of Friday, which is the day that you are launching your latest book. Which is exciting and the really exciting thing, and I know this because we share a Dropbox folder where we put together our audio for the podcast and I can see it filling up hour by hour, day by day with you recording exactly what you're doing in your launch sequence, exactly the process you're going through. And I'm quite excited as a new author to listen to the nitty gritty of how you launch your book. Yeah, it's been good fun. Every step along the way, I've kind of opened a file up and recorded a few thoughts which has been useful for me as well, just to kind of put that down and think about it a bit. And yeah, it's going it's going very well. I and mean, I'm reasonably confident that it will be a good launch. I'm not going to kind of pin my colours to the mast and say where I think it will end up. I'm hoping for kind of within the top 150 on the Amazon.com store. So yeah, we'll see. It's been good fun. And I think that episode will be very interesting for people who want to know how I, I launch books. Yeah. And what number John Milton book is this? This is the ninth novel, so the 11th book in total. Okay. You have to think about that, though, didn't you? You've so many of them. <laughs> For those of us who read Milton, can you give us a quick top line? Is there something exciting that happens? You're not killing him off or anything like that? That obviously <laughs> would be a spoiler, but... Well, I, I'm certainly not going to be dropping any spoilers, but it, it's fun. It's, um, it, it's called The Jungle, so people can probably guess where that... Well, certainly Europeans will know where, where that's most likely set, but he, he, he travels around France and Italy. He goes to uh, Libya, so there's a lot set in Tripoli, which was quite fun to write about. Mm-hmm. And a couple of... Uh, there's a really good fight scene in it with that you'll remember, James, from when we were working at the BBFC, a famous... If I said a famous David Cronenberg film with, a, with Viggo Mortensen. Yes, I'm aware. Um, Eastern Promises, a fight scene in a, in a Turkish bath where Vigo is, is completely naked and takes out two thugs who you know who have knives. Really, really good film and a great scene. So that was, that's was that been inspiration for one of the scenes in the Milton book. Naked fighting, like women in love. I, I think there's a lot of your, what's it normally locked inside your head coming out here. You should, you should be careful <laughs> how much comes out. Okay, well, look, yes. you're launching a book and uh, it's such a key part of marketing and it's a, it's its own art, art form, I think, and the way that you launch a book. So that's an episode definitely to look forward to in the future. Last week, we did a sort of masterclass episode on mailing lists. We've got another one coming up in a couple of weeks. What we're doing now is going to talk, actually, we're going to be a little bit unashamedly, a little bit about SPF now, because today's guest is somebody who Mark and I got to know through Mark's course on Facebook advertising for authors. And he's turned out to be somebody who's very quickly has become a help guru within the self-publishing community, uh, SPF in particular, but wider than that as well. He's somebody who understands how systems work and makes them work. And he's very interesting about the way he applies this. And we wanted to talk to him because A, to find out how he got stuff working and how he approaches writing. And it turned out he's very interesting on the way that he actually writes as well. I keep saying he, I should say it's John Logston is the name of the guest who's coming up in just a moment. But I just wanted to mention a moment, the community, the SPF community, but also the wider self-publishing community. And we've mentioned this before, but it's such a it's such a joyous thing to be in contact with other people going through the same things as you, having the same anxieties, but also finding the same solutions. I know you did your Facebook Q&A uh, on Friday night, and that went really well, didn't it? It did, yeah. So a bit of context. I did um, some uh, some Q and A's on Periscope um, last year, which is Twitter's live video streaming service, and that was great fun. Um, the people who you know we had some regulars coming along every Friday night, watched as I drank gin and tonic and answered questions about self publishing. 
So Facebook's rolled out its live video more um, widely now. So we decided, given that our presence is, is kind of biggest on Facebook that we do on Facebook this year. And I was on between about 10 p.m. UK time and 10 past 11 and had loads and loads of people uh, either along for the whole hour and a bit or popping in and popping out. People left, I think over 100 questions were left. We got through a good number of those. It was really, really fun. I love doing that kind of stuff and some really interesting questions that you know, had me thinking as well. So we're going to be doing that again. We're probably going to do it all the way through May and into June, I think. So Friday nights, if, if people are around um, and they want to ask me a question about anything to do with self-publishing, really, marketing especially, but I'll answer other bits and bobs as well. The place to find us is on the uh, self-publishing formula Facebook page, not the two groups that we've got, the actual public page, which I think you can find at facebook.com slash self-publishing formula, I think. But if you're a fan of that page, you'll be notified when I go live, but it will be around about um, 10 p.m. UK time, which I think is 5 Eastern. James will correct me if I'm wrong on that one, but um, yeah, that's I'm correct. pretty sure. I know you yep. get confused with time. Yeah, you had loads of people watching and loads of questions, so and that's a good thing. And it is because we know that we need to assimilate knowledge to get things right in this sphere, but I really like the way that people help each other, and uh, and, and you, Mark, in particular. I think that you, you put a lot of stuff out there. We should say that we've created a YouTube channel as well over the last few months, which is all part of us getting to grips with YouTube advertising but we're starting to upload some quite useful material to the youtube channel so if you just search the self-publishing formula you will probably find it on youtube and again there's a couple of help videos there now and there's going to be more in the future so let's move on to john logsdon and let me trail ahead a little bit because in a couple of weeks we're going to be speaking to uh, adam croft who's another student of the self-publishing formula and this has been a huge week I mean, it's been a huge year for adam so he's a student who um Uh, came on board with SPF in autumn of last year and uh, has had just incredible success since that point. In fact, this week he has been uh, posting on social media that he has been in the top 20 overall rankings on paperback for Amazon. Amazon of uh, using, I think, their own imprint. I think that's right. I've got I've got a copy of his book here, so I should look, but I'm sure it's the Amazon imprint that's yeah, published yeah. his book. And, uh, yeah, the overall top 20, I think he's into the close to the top 10 now. I think he's a couple behind the latest Harry Potter book. And that's absolutely <laughs> fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, he's done fantastically well. So he, he basically leveraged a deal with, I think it's with Thomas and Mercer, which is the imprint that I'm on with Amazon, just because he got so much amazing visibility from the, the Facebook campaigns he was running to, to push one of his books right to the top of the charts and um, Amazon noticed, reached out to him and, and the rest is history. And, and you know, this is, a, this is a good demonstration of what happens when you have the Amazon's marketing muscle, Facebook's marketing muscle, everything pointed in the same direction. The results can be really impressive. Yeah, so we're going to hear from Adam in a couple of weeks. But uh, let's move on to tonight's interview. So John P. Logsdon, he writes science fiction, they're all humorous. He has fantasy uh, series as well. He's a super interesting guy to talk to, and I think you're going to enjoy the interview. Okay, so we are joined by John Logsdon. John, you're over there in, uh, on the east coast of the United States. That's correct. I'm in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. It's about uh, six mi- six hours, I should say, south of Washington, D.C. Okay, six hours south of D.C. on the East Coast in North Carolina. But your book world takes us beyond the earth, and I can see straight away. In fact, I must confess, full confession at the beginning, I haven't read any of your books yet, John, but you are on my list because... Douglas Adams was uh, an idol of mine, my favourite writer of all time, and I can see lots of Adams influence in there in your book, particularly the Platoon F, which I'm, I'm itching to get my teeth into. And if you if you scan your mailing list, you will find a recent edition, which is uh, my name. So I'm going to get into your books in the next few weeks. But what we want to talk to you about, and one of the main reasons we've got you on here, is because uh, again, full confession, the reason that we know each other and you've come into our sphere is because you actually bought into Mark's course that was launched last year. And uh, you were somebody who we noticed adopted things very quickly, got to grips with things quickly, uh, and not just in our area and our course, but in other areas of self-publishing as well. Um, 
you're a bit of a Mr. Help guy. Uh, everyone sorts of comes to you to get things sorted, and uh, you're very helpful at doing that. And your own journey as a writer is an interesting one, and I think you're at a stage where probably a bit ahead of quite a lot of people and then a little bit further back from people like Mark and so on, but an interesting phase. You've got one foot, almost one foot, into the kind of full-time writing. You're, you're not too far away. And so we're going to talk to you on the podcast about how you got there, about your approach to writing in particular, because you're quite prolific, and a little bit some pieces about how you approach the marketing side of things, if that's okay. Sounds great. Great. Okay. Well, should we start with your background? I know you've worked in uh, in IT and video games. You've got quite a, a history in video games. We haven't got time to go into all the details of that. But, uh... <laughs> See, that's where my background comes from for writing, is really television, movie, and games. Uh, it's not necessarily reading other authors. A lot of people think that what I write, you know, comes from Terry Pratchett and such. And actually the, the truth behind that one is I released Ononakin, the first book called A Quest of Undoing, and then the second book, The Full Moon Event. And I also released Starliner before I'd ever heard of Terry Pratchett. A friend of mine uh, in Scotland actually had been reading A Quest of Undoing and he said that the wizard reminded him of Rincewind. And he said, I should check out Terry Pratchett. And I said, I don't know what rinse wind is, but okay. <laughs> so I picked up the uh, book Thud. And then of course I'm hooked. And at that point I read everything by Terry Pratchett. So my books actually aren't influenced by Terry Pratchett. They are somewhat by Douglas Adams. I won't say that they're heavily influenced. It's it, honestly, my real influences come from things like Monty Python, Benny Hill, Naked Gun, you know, Airplane, movies like that, that just the crazy over the top stuff from television and movies. That's really where it comes from. And of course, you know, now there's getting a little bit more when it comes to other authors, but primarily it's it's TV and movies. So comedy bigger than science fiction in your motivation, in your, I think you've quoted Austin Powers as well in Red Dwarf and Futurama. Uh, these are mm -hmm. all very comedic. Completely what has influenced all of my writing. And actually, it's also what influenced my ability to write fast, which we'll talk about, I guess, in a little bit. But yeah, it all comes from that. Well, let's get on to that, because I think that's uh, one of the areas that uh, people like to talk to you about, and we certainly do as well. You uh, you can be a prolific writer. I think you consider 5,000 words a day as kind of the lower end of what you want to do. And how do you do that, John? Because you're still working, right? Yes, I'm still working full time. Um, it, it's tough. I, I think it... it one of the things that I've, I've learned to be very good at, and this all came from working at, in California um, at, at a startup, was you have to learn how to be very efficient. And so you need to learn processes that work for you. And everybody else has ton, tons and tons of process. One of the points that, for example, why I adopted Mark's course so easily was because his process worked for me. I tried many others, but his was the only one that really clicked with me. And I think that's just my personality type. So whenever I see something that can be done faster, more efficient, while still allowing me to retain quality, because that's a big deal. If it, if it makes my stuff terrible, I'm not going to do it. So it has to retain that quality. That's what I gravitate towards. So what I did was basically I'd started out writing the traditional way. I sat down and I tried to write this big outline. I, I had, you know, created character profiles. I went through all of that because every single book out there said, this is what you're supposed to do. So I did. And it took me forever to do that. And then I wrote out the book. And when I was done, the book was horrible. I then tried it again with uh, the book Starliner. And after about a year and a half, I finally got the guts to say, okay, I'm going to turn this over to the editorial department. They got it back to me in about, I, don't know, I guess it was around three months later and essentially said, you know, you should really don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, I was like, oh, great. So honestly, I, I kind of put it aside for a couple of years. Uh, you know, the ego was, was a bit crushed on that. And then I said, you know, I think the biggest problem is I'm spending too much time trying not to be me. I need to be who I am with what I'm writing. I was trying to be, you know, I was trying to write literature and I don't write literature. I, I write stories. Anyway, I, I said, you know, I'm going to go back to what I did in the games industry. So here's what I do now. There's a program out there that's free. It's called Trelby. It's T-R-E-L-B-Y. And it is a scripting program. So for writing movie scripts or TV scripts and such. What I do is I start there. I basically just start scripting up some stuff where I put in character names and dialogue. You don't have to worry about description. You don't have to worry about setting up your scenes too much. It's just a quick one-liner for they're in a spaceship. That's it. You know, there's your scene. And then you just sit there and kind of go back and forth with the characters discussing things to each other. Now, what that does for me is that allows me to say, who does this character sound like? Is it somebody famous? Is it somebody I know? Because we all say in our books, you know, this is, you know, anything is purely coincidental. But at the same time, 
I mean, we all basically base our characters at least loosely on somebody we know or some stereotype of what we know. And so I'll sit there and I'll go back with these dialogue uh, back and forth between these two characters or three or four, whatever. And I start learning who they are, what they're like, everything else. Now, this is when I'm starting a series, by the way. And so at this point now, I get the idea of who does this character look like in my head? What do they sound like? Now, I also do character voices. So I'll sit around and I'll also start reading that script to myself so I can build that voice in my head. And even if you're not great at voices, just getting the voice in your head. For example, let's say, um, are you guys familiar with Fletch? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Chevy Chase. So, yes. So just imagine one of your characters, and then you basically say, you know what? He doesn't act like Fletch, but he sounds like Fletch. And then you say, okay, now this person sounds like Gandalf. This person sounds like, and you know, you can just keep doing this. Well, all of a sudden, you start having this feeling of, I know exactly who this character is. So when I start writing that character, I can see the character. I can hear the character. I know what they're like. They might be Fletch's voice with Gandalf's personality, which is kind of weird, but you, you see what I'm saying? Mm. And so you've, you've built this and it's all done through scripting as opposed to I'm building out this massive scene, which you may just throw away. So that alone allows me to get into the process very quickly. After I've done that, then I say, okay, I'm ready to start the first book. And at this point, I usually sit with my co-author and we just bounce ideas, but you can bounce ideas off of your friends or your spouse or whatever, you know, who cares? You're just bouncing ideas back and forth and, and you're having fun doing it. And he and I will sit there and do that. And what we'll do is we'll do an outline, but it's very, very loose. It's basically one or two sentences per scene. That's it just straight through one or two sentences. We have an idea of what the characters are like. We know how they're going to interact. So that's not a big deal. We just want to make sure that the story arc works, that we're not missing anything. So, you know, we, we go through that process. That takes me probably about, I don't know, I'd say two hours to, to write out a, a script, uh, maybe three. Uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not a script, an outline, about three hours. And then I hand it off to him. He looks at it. I look at it. And a few days later, we come back and we tweak it a little bit. And then we say, okay, we're ready to go. So at this point, I go back into Trelby and I have this, uh, the outline to my left and I start literally just writing the script. I'm not worried about details. I'm not worried about anything else. I can get through that script for a 60,000 word book, which probably is going to be around 150 to 200 pages of script is going to be probably about a week is, is all that'll take me to do. And so when that week is up now, I have a full script. At this point, I can bring that script into Scrivener. Now, you can also write scripts in Scrivener, by the way. I just don't personally like their layout. But uh, you can bring that script into Scrivener. And then that's when you start building your entire story around that script. And, and your script is not going to be final. So as you're typing things away, you've already written most of the dialogue, but you're going to have to change things based on when people come in and so on and so forth. And by doing it that way, I'm able to focus on what I'm really good at, and that is dialogue. I'm not fantastic at writing descriptions or scenes and everything else. That's not my strong suit. I can do it, but it takes me longer to do that. But it's really hard when I try to write those descriptions and then I'm just itching to get to the dialogue, but I can't because I have to first write the description. This is what got me doing it scripting first. So again, I said, I'm a TV movie guy, so write scripts. And I can make those scripts into full scenes by making the whole quote movie in the book at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's that's pretty good. And, and that's not too far away from something that I do. Dialogue is always a good jumping off point for me. Just a conversation between two characters. I'll have a rough idea of where the story is set and I'll have a kind of a start middle and end point so I know where I'm going. But if, if I want to actually get started, the best way is just to imagine that you're observing a conversation between character one and character two and then just seeing where it goes. So yeah, that's that's a that's a really good tip. I've never heard anyone take it to that extent before, but you know, it's working brilliantly for you. So it's a really interesting system. Uh, the other thing, I don't know if a lot of folks are using Scrivener out there or not, but there's a tool inside of Scrivener that allows you to uh, gauge how fast you're writing. Uh, I believe it's in the tools. It's around the project statistics area. You can actually see, you can set it up to see how how fast are you typing. I don't look. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Now, this is this is really key because I was doing about uh, oh, gee, was, I guess around uh, 300 to 500 words an hour or something like that when I started, and then I found this tool, and then I said, okay, I want you to get, I want you to start working on throwaway stuff, nothing I'm going to use, but I want you to try to write as fast as you can, and then see where you're making mistakes, where's your quality issues, and so on and so forth, because it was all about quality assurance also to make sure you can do this, and now at this point I can do between two and 3,000 words an hour and at quality that I find 
almost acceptable. Not quite, but almost. And and I will re, you know go back and tweak and, and all that anyway. But um, I can do around two to three thousand words an hour, especially in a book where I genuinely know the characters like Platoon F. No problem. I, I actually the last book in Platoon F. I was actually able to to bear down and write on it. It was uh, 62,000 words, I think it was. And I wrote that in four days. Wow. And that's because the, so much of it is already yeah. formed in your head. Yeah. You're in the universe and the writing part comes a natural flow to you. So it's in- interesting listening to the two of you talk about that, because I guess that, Mark, you've developed a system and a way of getting into the writing mm-hmm. process other people will do a little bit of, of what you're talking about. But your approach, I mean, is that almost something that you could write down and, and hand out as the, the Logston <laughs> method or something as a as something some people because it's almost a templatable, isn't it? The way you've you've Yeah, set it um, actually uh, it, it's something that you know we'll probably put up on our site at some point and, and talk to how to do it. We've talked about it on on our uh, I've run a podcast also with a, a friend of mine, uh, Ben Zackheim, who does books. He he and I have done a, a book together as well. So we've talked about it a few times there in, in the past, but uh, we haven't talked about it recently. It's something that it's definitely different than a lot of people are used to. But once you get used to it, it's it's actually pretty cool. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your um, your back catalogue then. So, uh, Onanokin, is that how to it pronounce it? It depends uh... on where you're from. It's interesting. Oh. Uh, everyone in the UK calls it that, <laughs> which I find which I find fascinating. Okay. Over here, it's Onanokin, but I like oh, the way okay. that you guys pronounce it better. <laughs> actually, the gentleman who does my narration for the Onanokin series, <laughs> I'm trying to say it your way, he's the one who first pronounced it that way for me, and. I was actually kind of taken aback and said, you know, it sounds posh when you say it. When I say it, it just sounds American. <laughs> so so I definitely yeah. prefer the way that you say it, well, yes. There is an English thing that we pronounce the back end of words more prominently than most European countries as well, actually. So, I mean, it's like I, I used to work in news and we had this with things like Slo- Slobodan Milosevic, who we always used to say that, but until somebody told us it's Slobodan ah. Milosevic. And uh, what's the other one? Um, Maria Sharapova. We still say, sports people in the UK still say Maria Sharapova, but she will always call it Sharapova because that's how you, how you say it in Russia. But anyway, we said so that's how... It's obviously inbuilt somewhere into us to stretch out the second half of, uh, of every word. Anyway, that's one series, and the Platoon F is a separate series as well. How many books have you got in? in so in Onodakin, we've got four, and we've got three more planned for this year. I'm not sure if we're going to hit three this year, but we're going to try. For Platoon F, I just released book number eight, and we have one more planned for this year, which is going to actually take the story arc from book one all the way through book nine. That's going to be done hopefully in the next, I would guess, four or five months. Mm-hmm. Well, that's some planning, right? I mean, <laughs> that's that, that's the kind of planning that goes into future armor. I wonder, I wonder if they pulled the same thing we're doing, though, because to be honest with you, when we wrote books one through five, actually, I wrote book one by myself. It was my co-author was just like, eh, I think that's not for me because it, it is when you get there, it, it's somewhat juvenile and purposefully so. It was a situation where I had written Ononakin, Starliner, eh, I'm sorry, A Quest of Undoing. Uh, the Full Moon Event, and then Starliner. And Starliner was a really hard book to write because we were trying to not go over the top, but at the same time have a lot of characters, a lot of depth, a, a lot going on in that world. And and frankly, to be totally truthful with you here, we've been terrified to write book two because we don't think it ever is going to stand up to book one. But so I was exhausted and I was like, I just want to write something I don't have to think too much about. I just want to have fun. And so I decided to write Platoon F and I wrote that first book, which is really just the, the first five episodes is what I call them because they're not really novels. They're barely novellas. They're, they're like 100, and, 100 to 120 pages each. Then now, of course, they're you know longer books, the, the later ones. But Chris was like, yeah, I don't think I want to be involved with this. Well, that book, the first one that I released sold 5,000 copies in three months. And then Chris was like, yeah, I want to be involved in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> It really took off, which was surprising, but there wasn't any plan at that point. It it was literally just write what you think and who cares, (laughs) have fun with it. And then people started liking it. I was kind of surprised, to be honest with you about that. By the time I got to book five, we were thinking, well, what are we going to do now? Is that it? So we said, you know, well, no, I actually want to write a full novel of this to see what it, you know, how it does. And so we did. We wrote the full novel. And at that point, I said, you know what? I can see an arc here that goes all the way through book nine if we step back. So we stepped back and looked at it. And sure enough, we had something built by accident, completely by accident. But by the time it gets through book nine, it's actually really neat. It's just 
we just got to get there. Yeah. So the idea is there. Talk to us a little bit about how you co-write then. So your your co-author, mm-hmm. Christopher P. Young, the two of you, I think you're, you've written every book together, as far as I can tell, um, mm-hmm. that, that you sell. Obviously, the scoping out the universe, which you've talked to us about already, you do that. I can see how that would work together, particularly the bits where you just sit next to each other and far off, um, you know, where you think characters are going to go. But in terms of getting on with the writing, is it simply a chapter each? Or actually, Chris doesn't really write. He's actually an excellent storyteller, very good storyteller. But uh, when it comes to writing, he just, he'll sit there and rewrite the same paragraph for literally weeks on end. So, you know, he's more of a hundred words a day kind of guy. So we basically came up with a pattern that works for us. I, I'm very fast. So I end up writing, you know, really quickly. Plus I do all these other things like hundred miles an hour. It's just my person. I guess I got ADD. That's my personality. But with Chris, it's more a case of he's good at remembering details that I may miss because I'm writing so many books and so many different series and so on that I might accidentally mix Ononakin in with Platoon F here. And he'll be like, hey, you just did that. You know, he can catch those things. He's good at uh, doing the research on the history and, and all that kind of stuff and keeping things kind of together. He's also a fantastic sounding board because our personalities are extremely similar. Our uh, comedy is both very irreverent. So, you know, we'll sit there. And, and by the way, he's in California and I'm on the, so he's on the West Coast, I'm on the East Coast. So we do this all via Skype. But so really what it is, is I write it all. It's all me. I do all the outlines. He actually did do the outline for one of our books, Gabby's Gadgets. And he was like, yeah, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> so uh, I do all the outlines. I do all the scripts. I do all the actual writing and everything else. And what's great is, is that Chris and I come up with the ideas together. I then outline it. We both kind of go over it. He makes sure that I'm not doing anything too stupid. Then we come back. We you know work it out together. Then I do the script, and then this is the best part. I love this part of the process. We get on Skype. He's got the script. I've got the script. We pick voices, and we just start going. And essentially, it's it's three hours of reading the script from top to bottom, and it would probably only take an hour, except that we're laughing uproariously the entire time. <laughs> it is so much fun. Is if that, if that- ever you can get into a situation where one per by the way, I have written with folks where it's like, you write a chapter, I write a chapter. Actually, Ben Zackheim and I did that. And it turned out okay, but I've tried with other folks and it does not always work out because let's face it, we have egos. You know, you might have a particular style of how you want to approach it. This person has a different style and so on. With Chris, it really is just a, a match made in heaven for us as far as that's concerned. Anyway, so we'll sit there and we'll laugh through things. Then I'll write the book and then I'll hand it over to Chris and I'll say, okay, you know, you've got two weeks, read it. And so he'll read it. He comes back with any suggestions, ideas, and so on. By this point, though, really we're done. I mean, our first draft is almost our last draft because we've done so much work ahead of time. And then uh, I make any changes that, you know, we need to, or if he says, hey, you know what, this whole chapter is just terrible and here's why, uh, then, you know, I'll make any changes there. And at that point, he's kind of backs off and says, all right, let me know when the next one's ready. And so from there, I'm, I'm the guy in charge of all the marketing and newsletter and dealing with the launch team and, and the whole deal. He's got the better end of the deal, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost like a dynamic editing process, isn't it? When you're talking out loud, you're going through the scripts, you're reading it. And presumably, do you, I mean, do you record the Skype sessions? How do you make notes? How do you, how do you transfer that into the next draft? Or I'd love to say changes? eidetic memory. Uh, no, I don't actually uh, do that. Uh, usually what we do is real time. I mean, he's got the better end of the deal also here because it's nine o'clock his time. It's midnight my time. By the time we're done, it's 3 a.m. for me and, you know, midnight for him and he's He's like, oh, I got to go to bed. I got to get up and work in the morning. I said, I got to get for work in like an hour. So, but yeah, yeah. so no, most of it is just done real time as, as we're talking. And I much prefer that as opposed to having to go back and record my, I don't really work well that way. For me, I'm, I'm the type of person that if you message me, I'm more likely to respond to you than if you write me an email. Well, let's uh, let's move on to the marketing side of it. I'm really interesting that the whole uh, writing approach. I'm sure a lot of people will glean something from that. It's, it's one area I think people are always on the lookout for some inventiveness and a, mm-hmm. a, perhaps a new approach. In terms of marketing, we know obviously social media advertising plays a part in uh, a, a fairly significant part, I think, in your mailing list building and your sales. Is that the main thing for you? What other areas are you using right. to sell uh, your That actually now? is my primary focus, uh, basically using Mark System, the uh, Facebook ads, uh, are my primary approach, but I also find a lot comes from my launch team helps a lot with that too. Just the sharing and uh, so on. I, I tell you, I, I got to say, if anybody out there doesn't have a launch team, you're missing out. You need a launch team. They're awesome. Okay. Well, let's, let's not assume too much knowledge. We've talked about launch mm-hmm. teams before, but let's 
pause for a moment to just explain to somebody who doesn't know what a launch team is that what okay. exactly it is. Uh, so essentially, as I define it, some people define them as uh, beta readers or, or so on, or street teams, maybe. Uh, for me, a launch team is essentially a group of people who are super fans of yours. They really love your stuff. They like what you're doing. And it's kind of like a support system. You, I have a Facebook group for them. I go in there and I talk to them almost all the time. I mean, I'm in there every day and just saying, hey, what are you guys doing this weekend? I mean, we're friends. We're, they're people who love my books, but we're also friends. And then I say, hey, I've got this new cover. What do you guys think of it? And I get feedback from them and so on. Then I say, okay, I've got a couple of sample chapters. I just want to send them your way. You know, kind of give them little teasers and, and things that nobody else can get, stuff like that. So they feel you know, like, wow, I'm getting some cool stuff out of this too. Then when it comes time for me to actually release the book before I send it to my editor, what I do is uh, I hand it to my launch team and I say, look, this is not edited, but here's a Google sheet. And if you guys spot anything, please go in here and, and say where you spotted it, what you found and what you think it should be. So they're basically bug reporting for me. I ended up getting like 120 or 150 re reports of, you know, you misspelled this, you did that wrong, whatever. So it's basically pre-edited before I hand it to my editor, which means it's going to happen faster for me, which is good because my wife happens to be my editor and she gives me nasty looks sometimes. So, so anyway, after I do that, I, I say to them, okay, now you guys are reading that not only with the, you know, the editing in, in mind, but, and they don't have to do that part, obviously, but also to formulate a review. I don't actually look for beta readers, to be honest with you. Uh, actually, as, as we kind of pointed out, I think with Chris, Chris is the uber beta reader. You know, he knows the, the stories better than most anyone but me probably. And, and so he's a great beta reader for that. But the launch team does come back and say, hey, you know what? I noticed your character did this here and that doesn't seem right. He Wouldn't he do this? And, the, and then I, ah, you're right. And then I'll, I'll, they're just fantastic that way. They really give you a lot of uh, feedback. And then as soon, anytime that you're going, wow, I just got this message from somebody and I can't believe that they actually emailed me. That one guy emailed me and said that I should never be a writer and all this kind of stuff, right? And, you know, it, it's kind of like, Ugh. so, you know, I don't share that guy's email with anybody, but I just basically say, you know, I got this email in. Well, next thing you know, they're, they're your support crew. They're in there saying, ah, no, your books are fantastic. I love this. Please don't ever stop writing. It makes you, you know, pumped up and you're ready to start writing again and just get back into it and, and everything else. They're just, I tell you, they're just the best thing that I can imagine having as a writer. Yeah, I mean, that's I completely concur with that. About a week ago, a, one of my readers, he wasn't actually on on my team. I, he may not even have been on my mailing list, but he contacted me and said that the kind of military history, the background for one of my main characters was, was a bit off. And and this is a special forces soldier, so um, I I said to him, okay, would you like to you know have a have a stab at correcting the mistakes? And he just sent me a long email today with. A, a really authentic background that that I'll probably now incorporate um, because of course we can go back and change things and correct them as we go along. And, and he did that because he loves my books, which is, I mean, apart from being incredibly generous on his part, it's massively motivational on my part and it makes my books better. So that's just, that's a small example I've had. Um, you know, I, I'm completely with you on the launch team front there. They're just fantastic and everyone should be taking steps to, to put one together. Absolutely. And it's so humbling too, when you, when you have all these people out there and you're just having a, maybe a bad sales day or, or whatever, you got two bad reviews on Amazon, whatever it is. And then you go in there and you see all of these people are making quotes and creating little stories in your universe. And it's just unbelievably humbling. It's, it's fantastic. I think it is, it's definitely worthwhile covering that because you've, you've done so well with uh, building a list and then building a, a launch team from it. So it would be, it would be useful, I think for listeners just to hear, uh, where you were uh, and, and and how far and how fast you, you've you traveled to, to get where you are now. Yeah, actually, I'd love to share this because I think this is such a cool story, to be honest with you. Um, I, I released my first book. Um, it was, I believe it was 2013. And then the second one, it was like, uh, I don't know, the next year I released two more books. And um, then I, when I released the Platoon F first book and I get 5,000, uh, you know, sales, <laughs> And I'm thinking, okay, I've made it, you know, um, I'm, I'm literally at this point going, well, I guess I'll just go ahead and retire and you know, start writing. Uh, three months later, I found out that wasn't going to work out. <laughs> but anyway, I said, but I, I, I need to somehow capture these readers. I have no idea how, but I'm going to try. So in the backs of the books, you know, I would put links to my other books and all this kind of stuff. And then I said, let me try this MailChimp thing and see what I can do there. Well, over the course of a year, I added 
I, I think the actual number is 27. I usually just say 25 because it's easier, but I think it was 27 people. And I would uh, say that most of them are friends, family, probably two or three of them were me from separate, different email addresses for testing. <laughs> you know, of course, thanks, mom. I'm sure she also signed up there and so on. But really over the course of a year, and I'm just sitting there thinking that was normal. Then all of a sudden, I tried all these different systems out there. None of them worked for me. They just didn't. And I I just couldn't find somebody who spoke my language, I guess. So I don't want to put any systems down. I'm just saying it just didn't work for me. So anyhow, one day, you know, my wife, again, she's an editor. She also is an author, but she's an editor. And she says to me, uh, a friend of hers, uh, Martha Hayes, said, hey, you should check out this guy, Mark Dawson. He's doing this uh, teaching thing. And this is a true story. So (laughs) be prepared, Mark. My, My wife said she's saying you should do this. And I said, I don't know who this guy is. Why am, <laughs> why am I going to do this? And she says, no, c- come on. And at this point, I'm highly jaded. Okay. I'm making maybe $5 a month in sales. If that, I still have the same 27 subscribers. I've, I'm going nowhere, really nowhere. And so out of spite, out of pure spite, I said to my wife, fine, I will go ahead and do this system. And I will do this system to the T because I'm going to prove to you it is not going to work. And then you'll leave me alone. That was truly what happened. And so I sat down and I looked at your website and I copied your website. Sorry, but I did. (laughs) And then I sat there and I put my books up just like you have yours. I did the whole thing. And then I watched your videos and I did the exact same thing you said. Obviously, I couldn't use your book covers. I'd use my own, but I did the exact same thing you said. It took me about a week. I busted my hump to get it done, but I got it done. And then I said, okay, I'm going to spend five bucks on Amazon and I'm going to show you that this doesn't work. Or I'm sorry, on Facebook. This English guy is an idiot. That's right. (laughs) Exactly. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. Exactly. I'm sitting here going, like I said, I said, it's not going to work, but you know, I just worked for a week and I just really wanted to rub her face into this. Right. (laughs) So anyway, I spent five bucks on Facebook ad and there it went up and everything else. So the next morning I wake up and I had two subscribers and I was just like, All right. So I got two subscribers out of a week's worth of work. Way to go, babe. That was awesome. And so the next day I had five more and I was like, okay, so five more. The next day, I think it was around 15 and then it went up to like 30 and I was going, and this was, I'm not, I'm not talking 30 since the first day. I'm talking 30 that day. Mm -hmm. So the first day was two, then, then five, then 15 or whatever. And then 30 the next day. And then all of a sudden I'm getting like between 30 and 50 subscribers every single day. And I was, so I gave her a hug, right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm like, well, Mark's the man. And so I started working on this and working on this. And so one day I just said to her, I said, I can't believe this is happening, but I want to put a hundred dollars into this ad. I just want to see what happens because this is incredible. So I spent a hundred dollars and I got 400 subscribers that day. Ooh, wow. Yeah. 400. And it just, oh, (laughs) that blew my mind. And so anyway, obviously what I was selling, uh, the advertising that I had done, but here's the, here was the kicker. Other people who, who have come to me, what I find that they have done wrong is they don't do what you tell them to do. They all come and they say, I'm going to put my spin on them. Don't put your spin on it. Do what he tells you to do. That's what I did. And I did it out of spite, but it worked, (laughs) but it worked. And so now every time I create an ad, I literally go back and I look at your videos from the beginning and I basically say, okay, that's right. Yeah, I got to do this. Yep, I got to do this. And I do it over and over again. And every time those ads are successful. And when I sit there and create ads and I don't pay attention, I'll just do this one myself. Almost inevitably, they are awful. They never do well at all. So that is the the biggest thing that I learned is number one, if you're going to do a system, do it with spite. Apparently that's, that's a good thing. And number two, mm-hmm. follow it to the T. Now, of course, now I've gotten to the point where I still will follow what you're saying, but I also have to make some tweaks now and then because, you know, you just have to as time goes on. But yeah, so that's where I came from. And, and that's, uh, you know, I've amassed around 13,000 subscribers uh, in one year. What would you say? I get this question quite a lot when, when I'm talking at web conferences and things, and I'm going. To, I'm actually speaking at the London Book Fair next week, and I'm fairly sure one of the questions I'll get because I always get it is, "I'm a new author. What is the first thing that I should do?" And my answer to that is always because I, I dropped the ball on this and I didn't do this right up, up front like I should have done. Was focus on a mailing list. Don't worry about sales too much in the early days. It's more important to get subscribers. Mm-hmm. And occasionally, in fact, more than occasionally, quite often people will they just don't get it. They you know I don't, why would I want a mailing list? I don't understand that. So what would you say to what would your answer be 
the primary thing is it's sad, but it's true that readers don't care about you until they care about you. So if you can get a person in by, uh, you know, either it's the book that the only book you have or a short story that you've written or whatever, where they can come in and they can actually take a chance on you by signing up to your newsletter, because yes, that is huge. You have to have that. Then at that point, they might care about you. And if they read your stuff and they get what you're doing, you instantly have somebody who's going to come back and care about you. So this is why I say don't focus on sales at first to people, because that's what I did for the longest time. But nobody cared about me, so nobody's going to buy anything I've done. So if instead I give them something and in in return, I say, give me your name or your email address, rather. At that point, I'm giving you the opportunity to check out something of mine for free, which, you know, hey, if you don't like it, it was free. What are you going to do? But at the same time, I'm getting the opportunity to hope that you're going to care about what I'm doing next. And that, to me, is where the relationship comes in. You don't have a relationship with the reader if all you're trying to do is sell. So building the mailing list, what you're really doing, in my mind, what you're really doing is you're building a relationship with the reader. And if you build that relationship, At that point, every time you release something new, which is a little not true with me because Platoon F fans on one side, No Nonakin on the other side, they're kind of separated there. But anytime I release something with Platoon F fans, I know I'm going to get sales from them. I know I'm going to get shares from them. I know I'm going to get all that. If all I did was focus on just selling and not focused on newsletter, all I would get is probably $5 a month like I was getting before. I think you've put your finger on it there. I think the reason you've done so well, it, it, apart from the fact that you, you've hit the ads really well and they've worked really effectively for you, the reason I, I suspect you're doing well is because so we've never met apart from you know, talking on the phone a few times. You're very affable and you're very easy to talk to. And I think you you get that it, it's it's not about buy my book, buy my book. It's it's more about tell me about you. Would you like to know about the, the problems I had writing a hundred pages today? You know, that kind of stuff, the, the kind of the, the interesting stuff that it isn't all about selling. It's building relationships. It's turning readers into friends eventually. And that's what you're doing with your, your street team. That is probably the nub of why you've been so successful over the last 18 months or so. So I mean, kudos can, you know, keep going. That's you're really doing fantastically well. Thank you. I have to say this, whenever anybody ever gets an email back from a potential reader or a reader, somebody who sent up to your newsletter or whatever, even if it's just through your website, whatever, always respond mm. and always respond kindly. Mm. I got an email. This is a great example. I got an email from a guy who said, you know, I signed up to your newsletter. I just want to let you know I am unsubscribing. I don't like what you're doing. The uh, humor is just I just find it very childish in this particular, in Platoon F and so on. It's very juvenile. I don't like it. It's a uh, toilet humor, essentially. And I honestly, I don't think you should be writing this stuff is pretty much what he was saying. So I replied back to him and I said, hey, I understand, you know, comedy is a very subjective thing. And th- the problem with comedy is, is that no matter what, you will always offend somebody. Uh, you can't avoid that. And I said, but you know what? I really appreciate that you took the time to let me know how you felt about it and everything else, because it's great criticism. And, you know, I always learn something from everybody. I just thank you very much for taking the time to read my stuff and to check it out. He wrote me back a week later and he said, you know, your email was so nice that I actually turned my brother and a friend of mine at work onto your stuff and they both love it. (laughs) So basically turning a negative situation into something like that, that's just fantastic. I also got another review from a guy a long time ago Terrible review. Just terrible. He said he thought I must be on drugs. So I replied to that, which is, I know, a big no-no. But at the time, I was using a pen name, which was, you know, I replied to that email. And and I, or I'm sorry, that review. And I basically said, you know, thanks for your response. I'm sorry you didn't enjoy it. I'm not on drugs. But, you know, and so he writes, he responds to that review saying, sorry that I said you were on drugs. That was probably not a nice thing to say. And then he went into all this other stuff. And then he says, but I just don't understand how somebody could write this and not be on drugs. So I said, okay, we're back to the drug thing again. So anyway, we started having this dialogue. And then I said, you know what, why don't we take this offline and talk on email? So we did. And I learned a lot about the guy. Number one, he was way out of my demographic, way out of it. I mean, he was like almost 80 years old. So you know, reading something that was written from, you know, me as a 13 year old's perspective is probably not the best book for him. But also he doesn't know about things like Futurama and Family Guy and South Park. He's not familiar with any of that stuff. So for him, it was completely out of left field. Well, the guy actually was in the military for a long time. He builds airplanes and he also turns his own pens, you know, like writing instruments. Mm. And he actually ends up sending me the last pen that he ever made before he could no longer do it because he has arthritis. 
I was amazed by that. Here's a guy that literally hated what I wrote, but we still became friends. I just think it's awesome. Mm. I mean, you know, it's all in how you treat people. It really is. Yeah, that's great tips. And uh, it resonates with some of the best, most prolific, successful authors we've heard have a, a similar attitude. Marie Force comes to mind straight away. It's, it's As Mark was saying earlier, it's about a conversation with your readers. It's not about a, an old fashioned business proposition. It doesn't work like that. And no, that's great. Really great to hear. And you're good Thank at you. it, John, as well. You're obviously a processes guy. We've, we, we're coming towards the end of our time uh, together, and I feel we've almost just scratched the surface. There's been some really good value stuff in it as well, from from your approach to writing through to marketing and, and the stuff on customer relations, if you want to call it that. Sounds a very boring way of calling what I just described as a conversation. But you're obviously a processes guy, which I like uh, as well. The fact that the way you approach Mark's course, it reminded me of how I make recipes in the kitchen. I do not deviate. And there's a recipe, someone's put some time into that. That's how it works. And it drives me insane when people say, oh, a bit more of this, a bit more of that, like they do on TV. No, <laughs> don't do that. Do it the way the man says, because that's how it should be made. But there's something to be said, I think, for the way that your background has fed into the way that you approach writing. You come from a systematic world of programming. Now, as creative, I used to be a computer programmer. It's actually quite a creative thing, but also it's very procedural. And uh, I love the way that you've turned that into an approach to writing and marketing books. And it's yes, worked. For absolutely. You. I, I, and it's interesting. I'm also a musician and it also all stems from actually, if you look it up, you'll find that statistically speaking, a lot of programmers are either musicians or writers, which is kind of interesting because programming is a highly creative art. You're con- what you're doing is you're solving puzzles every single day mm-hmm. incessantly, which is why a lot of programmers, you might get burned out but you rarely get bored because every time you turn on the machine and you have a new project you have to work on, it's a puzzle you're trying to figure out. The same thing goes with, you know, music. The same thing goes with writing. It's, it's all a puzzle. And one of the things that I find though, is that if you're not enjoying the process of writing, you're doing something wrong because it is fun. And if it's not fun, why are you doing it? I love to write. I love to program. I love doing music and everything else. If if I didn't, I wouldn't be on this call with you right now. Look, it's been absolutely fabulous talking to you, John. Thank you so much indeed for coming onto the podcast. It did turn into a little bit of an advert for Mark's course in the middle, so I should say that other online courses are available. But they're not as, but they're not as good. To keep the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> now now but to keep the podcast yes, as a valuable asset and in, in an objective market yeah but yes no clearly we are part of a revolution in that area and you're a leading light in that that sense both of you are in your your respective corners and that so it's been great john from north carolina we may even see you later this year which would be great so we're going to probably have a little trip to the u.s ourselves and we'd love to drop in on you at some point and see a little bit of the the logston operation uh, for ourselves Awesome. That would be fantastic. And I I really appreciate you guys having me on. It was fun. John was a delight to talk to. And like I did say in the interview, he's a procedural guy. So he works out an approach. And I know some people approach life in a slightly more creative, artistic, haphazard way. And that works for them. And other people need absolute procedures. And he's probably somewhere in between because it's a creative industry that he's in. But I really like the way that he'd thought through how to construct a, a book, how to approach a story and make it a writing process that worked for him. And he then applied that to Facebook advertising. And wow, he just got it right, didn't he? Yeah, he's he's done extremely well. But when it comes to subscriptions and growing a mailing list, he's he's probably the student that I'd point to as being one of the most successful, and certainly uh, the 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 one to go to. If, you know, very friendly and generous with his with his tips. One thing I didn't mention in the in the interview, James, was um, you know, Terry Pratchett was a big influence on him. Uh, Terry Pratchett lived about five miles from me. He lived in a village called Broadchalk, which is not too far from where I am in Wiltshire. And I saw him a few times in Salisbury. Very nice guy. Mm. Always, always well, easily spotted with his big beard and uh, and the hat he wore all the time. Nice guy. Sadly missed. Yeah, there's a great photograph of Terry Pratchett at a, a fan event. I always liked. And he's wearing a t-shirt. And if, <laughs> if you scrutinise it, it says J.K. Rowling wouldn't come. <laughs> J.O.R. Tolkien is dead. Douglas Adams is dead. Hello, I'm Terry Pratchett. A very modest guy, <laughs> um, very humble, and uh, sadly taken from us far too early. And uh, I should also say that I said at the beginning of the interview, we we spoke to John that I hadn't read any of his books. I've corrected that. 
since then. I am now racing through his Platoon F season uh, series, which I'm absolutely loving. It is quite puerile. It's quite <laughs> silly, but it's it's an amazing little universe he's created of this slightly incompetent planet and system and military organisation. And it's laugh out loud if you like that sort of thing. It's laugh out loud, so I'd thoroughly recommend it. And um, yeah, I'm I'm certainly have benefited from the way that he's put together his books with his writing partner. Okay, that's it. So as we mentioned before, there is a Facebook Q&A on Friday night. So if you're picking this up on the day of release, that is tonight, Friday, which is at 10pm in the UK, which is 5pm Eastern. And it sits there on Mark's timeline on his Facebook timeline. No, not your Facebook timeline on the self-publishing formula Facebook timeline. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, that's correct. I have to correct myself there. Good. We've got another episode. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk to Adam Croft, a very interesting interview with somebody who has had a stellar year and he's particularly brilliant to listen to in terms of mindset that you need as an author to be successful. And he's got so he's got the kudos now behind that to back that up. And we're going to do another masterclass uh, in the next couple of weeks as well. Lots of good stuff to come. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, We're going to say goodbye. You from Sleepy Hollow there in uh, Wiltshire and me in Flat Plains of Cambridgeshire. (laughs) Yes, bye-bye. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.